Hello and welcome to all new first issues of the weekly comic review show. These are the polls from March 23rd, 2016. I'm the archivist Bradley Nephilim, and before I start this stuff properly, the next first issues is going to have a different look. Though I'm still trying to work on how it'll look, it'll probably be an amalgam of what's now and what was my last version of first issues. We also have two new segments joining Flashback Firsties after the ad break next week, one focusing on the first chapter of any given manga, and another on the first 25 or however many are available, pages of a webcomic. Best part? You get to name them. The answer I like the best will become the official name for either segment, and in trade, you get to pick a comic for binging on comics or honest comic trailers. Sweet, huh? Oh, and after first issues proper, I'll be showing how much each weekly pull of number ones cost. Several people have asked how much doing this show costs, so I figure I'd show my card at the end. Okay, all done with news and everything? Excellent. Now let's belly up to the bar and get things started. First up is... Marvel Comics Hyperion No. 1, written by Chuck Wendig, art by Nick Varela, and colors by Romulo Fajardo Jr. I really should read the Squadron Supreme book, shouldn't I? I mean, this has Hyperion doing the Superman Grounded storyline, trying to figure out his life and everything like that, but only he's a trucker, and he gets pulled into fighting a dark carnival. Yes, an ICP joke aside, honestly, I'm really interested in this version of the character. I haven't read the latest Squadron Supreme book, so I don't know why he's taking a break, but for what it is, it's a good intro to both the character and the adventures he'll be on. Though, maybe having a weird circus theme as the first villain isn't exactly the best step forward. The only reason I say this is that Hyperion is Marvel's direct analogy to Superman. He's got the eye beams, the super strength, flight, and all that still, it seems, so why have his first solo bad guy group be a weird traveling carnival? Or is it going to be one of those, they travel and he travels so they can keep meeting up a few times? It's not a deal breaker by any means. It's still definitely a solid read, and I'd even say that with how well it sets up at least this first storyline, you won't feel cheated if you went out and bought it. Then we enter the indie scene proper, starting with... Image Comics Circuit Breaker No. 1, written by Kevin McCarthy and art by Kyle Baker. Another comic that uses robots as a second-class citizen analogy. And in Japan, or rather a Neo-Japan megacity thing after the apocalypse. Well, yes, this is probably not the most groundbreaking, and honestly, you can really feel the anime-manga influence on this, mixing Astro Boy, Cyborg 009, and that sort of feel. But as we all know, it'll take one robot that can pass as human to save the day. I'll be honest, I was looking forward to this when it came up onto my pull list. But the execution on this was so sloppy. I was really trying to come up with a diplomatic way of saying this, but honestly, this is a webcomic that shouldn't have been published yet. The dialogue writing is very much exposition throughout, but that's not the problem. Honestly, the first several pages aren't bad. Just heavy-handed and going, See, this is the crux of the story, don't you see? But then it becomes a total mess when trying to throw literally every setup needed against the wall. The art itself isn't also a bad aping of the manga style, but you can tell that it's just an aping of the style without the same meticulous nature that goes into your average manga. I could see this being passable in a webcomic fashion, where you'd get maybe two pages a week, maybe the first six pages or so as a buffer to at least lay out the plot and not make it so whiplashy. Honestly, and I'm going to say this as unapologetically as possible, while fans have their place in any given fandom, this is a good case of why being a fan doesn't necessitate a good creator. I honestly say that it's skippable, though I am going to have a couple otaku friends give it a look through, because maybe I'm out of the scene. I'm making it officially skippable right now, but if that does change because I need to be a fan, I will make a video strictly saying I'm sorry to this book. Until then, let's move on to Possibly Better Pastures. Titan Comics Assassin's Creed Templars No. 1, written by Fred Valenti and art by Dennis Calero. Short summary, we follow a son taking over for his father in the Templars, while also being introduced to the Black Cross, a Templar agent who basically runs assassinations within the society itself to protect its secrets and cut out the corruption growing within it. That's a neat concept in and of itself, and it's quite good. While I wouldn't say that it's anywhere close to a run out and buy it now, it really is a solid first issue. I've been following the ongoing Assassin's Creed comics, so seeing a smaller miniseries pop out of the side looking at the Templars, or at least this story about the Templars, is kind of neat within the universe of the games and comics and franchise as a whole. I would say that it is a read if you do like the Assassin's Creed universe. I mean, they can't focus on gameplay and faffing about, so you may finally get that Assassin's Creed story you want, maybe not from this, but from the ongoing comic regardless. Also from 
Titan Comics Independence Day Number 1, written by Victor Gershler, art by Steve Scott and Rodney Ramos, with colors by Stephanie Renee. Well, this issue wasn't what I was expecting. Like a lot of people I've talked to about this issue, we assumed it'd be a tie-in to the upcoming Independence Day sequel, Resurgence. But nope, the plot actually starts during the end of the first movie, and really deals with the recovery and possible dangers of the crashed mothership. And no, spoiling right now, none of the fan-favorite characters from the movie pop in, at least not in this issue. Something that Titans Comic does very well is make a book that is enjoyable outside of continuity with their licensed materials. For something like Assassin's Creed, it's simply by going to a time not used. And for their Doctor Who, it's because it's easy to make a standalone adventure with the character. So it's a neat thing to see the world of the Independence Day given new light without going straight for the sequel. Granted, it also can tie into the sequel later on since they're recovering the tech that people are using in Resurgence. So digressing back, this is actually a pretty fun story. The lead character is interesting, and the art really captures the feel of the movie, though it is a lot more dark and claustrophobic at times. So if you enjoyed the film, even on a dumb fun level, then I think you'll not be disappointed in this. There's even more story in this than random explosions. So give it a read. And to round off the Titan Pools, Titan Comics, Doctor Who, The Fourth Doctor, Number One. Written by Gordon Rennie and Emma Beebe, with the art done by Brian Williamson and colors by Hi-Fi. This certainly feels very much like Philip Hinchcliffe's era of the Fourth Doctor. We have the Hammer Films-inspired gothic setting, including Mysterious Veiled Woman and a Creepy Mansion and random Cyclops henchpersons, all wrapped in a now-cliché Doctor Who location of Victorian London. Yay! Seriously, though, the plot is fairly straightforward, with Sarah Jane being kidnapped and the Doctor having to find her, with the help of some rather obtuse locals. First off, the writing feels very much in tune with the show, though we actually don't get a lot of doctoring in this, more reactionary than taking action, to make way for the chrononauts that he stumbles upon. It's weird, but not bad. Similarly, Sarah Jane doesn't get to do her typical thing, and instead gets captured to lead us into the story, which was honestly something I don't rightly remember happening a lot. She would stumble in and get captured a few times, granted, but it was never grab the girl, leave the cannoli sort of situation. But that is explained at the end with a nifty cliffhanger that really does make me want to check out issue two. A big negative, at least to me, was the art. It jumps between being very close to realistic for the characters, at least Elizabeth Sladen and Tom Baker, but when the other characters are in it, you can tell that Williamson is using reference pictures for the angle and everything, as there tends to be unnecessary or awkward shading and placement. It's not bad just when it slips, it slips hard, so it's tough. My immediate reaction is that it's skippable, but honestly, most licensed comics can be. As for readability, I think it's a good, not great start to a Doctor story. But I'll be honest in that with things like Big Finish's phenomenal audio dramas, the show being available digitally, this may be a weaker buy. But if you're a fan, then you should definitely check it out in trade when it comes out, or give it a read for yourself and see what you think of it. And we're finally done with Titan. Onward to... Valiant Comics Bloodshot Reborn Annual Number 1, with a lot of segments from a lot of people. I hate reviewing anthology books for one reason. There's like six random one-shot stories being told, especially in this one, and they're all freaking awesome. My two personal favorites are a Friday the 13th parody, which becomes Bloodshot vs. Not Jason Voorhees, and another which is a jab at DC and Marvel's universe-screwing abilities, including a fun jab at Not a Gwen for legal reasons. Seriously, my verdict on this one is that it's worth the extra money for 60 pages of rip-roaring fun. Even if you aren't a fan of Bloodshot, by the end of this, you'll definitely be on a boat ready for Valiant Country, where Flava lives. Honestly, with varied art styles and writing, you'll get your favorite style in there whether you want it or not. Go and buy this right now. If you aren't fully satisfied, I'll personally apologize for being wrong on this. And honestly, this was one of my personal favorite reads of this week, but really, there's a high, high bar this week, so I could be very wrong. Next up, we have Devil's Do and One First Comics, Delete Number 1, written by Jimmy Palmiotti and Justin Gray, with art by John Timms, and colored, and colored by David Coriel. A family gets gunned down for their ties to illegal activities. Their deaf daughter witnesses it all, but a handyman saves her from the hit squad, and they run off into the night. Dull day, technically. 
The police investigate the event, but maybe all's not on the level with law enforcement. Okay, I really dug this. It was a solid setup to the adventure ahead. We get the cast of characters firmly established, so when the twist comes, great. I think the one problem with this could be that there is not really a reason why at least this issue is called Delete. I mean, people get eyes sure, but when the whole thing is supposed to be about memory erasing and everything, maybe it's best to not put that as your focal point in your opening summary when it doesn't factor into this issue. I mean, I could have missed it, but otherwise it's still a solid read. I dig the art, though it could have taken a page out of Fraction's Hawkeye, at least for the first time we see Kalina, the deaf girl, sign. Especially since we only see her sign once before the handyman comes in, and since he can't understand sign language, it would be neat. Granted, that could bite overseas sales, since American Sign Language is different than everywhere else. Short of it, if the summary interests you, go out and give it a read. Otherwise, it is kind of skippable. Onward and yonward, too! IDW's G.I. Joe Deviations Number 1, written by Paula Lore and art by Corey Lewis. In a world where Cobra turns the tides on G.I. Joe? Oh, well, yeah, technically that's happened a few times in the IDW comics. Anyways, this is about the show universe. So yeah, Cobra gets the upper hand for once, and five years down the line, the Joe's island base is now Cobra Island, because Cobra Commander controlled the weather. I assume using Pudge the Fish, just don't give him tuna. The basic plot is that only four Joes survived. But because of Cobra winning, everyone in Cobra is now kind of settled into their roles, be it security, IT, or even Destro, who's now a stay-at-home dad to raise his and Baroness's two kids. But there's one or two people that want Cobra Island leveled, so that they can get back to the status quo and back to the fighting. I don't care if you've never seen any of the G.I. Joe shows, or even if you hate it. This is hilarious. While it's not as quippy hilarious as Ghostbusters, it's the whole of the situation that just makes it all so much fun. I shared a panel of it on my Facebook page where you have Cobra literally still trying to cause chaos and mayhem, even though he's the one in power now. It's hilarious in the, wow, so that's what happens if an 80 cartoon villain actually won? It's really satisfying in execution, and the art is cartoony, but still its own thing and works great. Fun fact, I read these books in the order in which I pretty much present them, so there's a lot of times that I'll go, oh man, this is the best book, no one can top it, and then I have to change my mind. Luckily, I'm not doing top picks anymore, or else that would be awkward. Uh, anyways, let's pop over to... Xenoscope's Hellchild Number 1, written by Pat Shand, artwork by Vincenzo Riccardi, and colors by Eleonora Bruni. Oh, it's a good old-fashioned vampire hunting story. With Hades, the god of death as a street-level fighter paired up with a Van Helsing. Odd, but neat. Well, anyways, the titular Hell Child is the daughter of Hades, and boy, is she kind of a bitch. Granted, this ends with her being resurrected, so we aren't entirely sure who she is, save for the very start of the comic. Besides the fact that this whole issue is actually just an earlier-in-the-story spot, which could have easily not been there and made more linear, so we would have been introduced to Hades and Van Helsing girl easier. Plus, with the fact that Angelica the Hell Child and the Van Helsing chick are drawn fairly similar, I almost thought that it was going to take a neat swerve that the Van Helsing chick was going to become a vampire, but it didn't. Regardless of those nitpicks, this was a severely good read, with a lot of setup of what's coming, as well as giving us a clear feel for at least who Van Helsing is. Though, it does feel awkward that Hades, the god of freaking death, is playing off just basically being Angel to Lysel Van Helsing's Buffy. I really do need to look back and see if there's other books in this universe, because it feels like I'm missing a hell of a story, and I also want to see more build up to something like this. So yes, I suggest reading this, especially if you're a fan of the more lighter side of the vampire hunting genre. And now we gallop over to... Oh, did I really just make a galloping joke? I'm sorry. Dark Horse Comics, The Shadow Glass Number 1. Story and art done by Allie Fell. With a name like The Shadow Glass, and a setting in Elizabethan England, you'd assume that there's a lot of magic in this. But this was a surprisingly character-driven first issue. While we do start with a heavy dose of mysticism, the main crux of this story is honestly about a headstrong tomboy who must venture out and try and find a cure for standard tumor from the man that raised her. 
there's a lot that happened in this issue that I don't want to spoil. So my verdict is simple in that this is probably the best book I've ever read in first issues history. Now I know that's a bold statement, but let me put on my pretentious glasses for a second and I'll try and elucidate. Comic books as a medium measures out so much. What exactly do you put in the narration boxes if you're going to narrate at all? You know, what's the dialogue going to be? What are you going to show visually compared to spell it out for the audience. And when it comes to sequential art, this, this is the paragon of what a graphic novel is. While it isn't some deconstruction of superheroes, superheroines, or a genre, what it is, is a character drama with stunning art that really could play, and when you read it, you can see the cinematic quality of it. No, there's no giant 20-foot tall Cthulhu things, though there is a magical random evil tentacle coming out of the... Don't want to spoil. It's hard for me to explain, even with my pretentious glasses on. Short answer, this is the paragon of a graphic novel that everyone should read, especially because it's these kind of comics that showcase that comic books or graphic novels, whatever you want to call them, are not strictly exploitation, explosions, really bad character swerves. It's not WWE in page form. This is what the medium of graphic novels, of sequential art, can reach. And with all that said, of course it's worth a buy. Go out, get it, do yourself a favor. Because it's stuff like this that pushes that comics can be high art. I know, like I said, I had my pretentious glasses on. So seriously, go out and buy this. And to end the indie scene is something very, very, very indie indeed. Short Fuses, Like Father, Like Daughter, Number One, written by Catherine Calamia, art by Wayne A. Brown, and colors by David Aravina. Casey is the daughter of the world's only superhero, and she doesn't much like him since he abandoned her and her mother so he could become a superhero full-time. But she can't just sit around irked at her father anymore when she inherits something that can't be ignored, his powers. Full disclosure, the reason I know about this comic is because it was created by Comic Uno, a YouTube comic reviewer that I watch. But upon seeing the premise, I definitely got intrigued, and honestly, it didn't disappoint me. It's an interesting premise about following the shirked daughter of a superhero, or rather the only superhero, and really pushing the divide between her personal daddy issues and suddenly coming into his powers really well to set up the next issue of the series. Especially when showing that maybe invulnerable, the superhero a father might not be as good as all his interviews are letting on. Now, that isn't to say the book is perfect. The art itself is not for me. It's not bad art, and for the most part it is passable, but it's an art style I've never particularly cared for. But honestly, I don't think it'll break the experience reading the book, and this is definitely a book you should read. Even more than that, go out and buy it. This is a creator-owned book that showcases a lot of potential for the future, from the development of Casey as possibly a superhero, to the big reveal to her father all about this. So go buy this issue off Comixology, give it a read, and then head over to the website for any updates pertaining to issue two. Seriously, books like this need to be supported so they can have an issue two. Seriously, this is definitely worth checking out, and you should totally go do that now. And finally, we have DC Comics Superman Batman Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice Special Edition number one. <sighs> Written by Jeff Loeb, pencils by Ed McGinnis, inks by Dexter Vine, and colors by Dave Stewart. It's a rather quick romp with Batman and Superman teaming up to stop Metallo, who's threatening the Earth. Also, there seems to be a big ball of kryptonite heading straight for Earth, so Lex Luthor puts together his own crew to stop it, which includes Major Force and Captain Atom, plus others shrouded in shadows. Meh. My verdict is so very simple. It's free on Comixology, so there's no reason to buy it. While I'm not a fan of Ed McGuinness's art, it isn't bad art either, and Loeb has always been good when pairing up Superman and Batman. And that's all for first issues. It was a fairly hefty haul of about $43. Not pictured in my cart is Like Father, Like Daughter, since it came out a day after I did my initial buy. But hey, if you think about it, since there was only one comic that I truly didn't like in this, that cost the same as Like Father, Like Daughter, then I guess the number on screen is kind of how much this pull list was worth reading in dollar form. Don't forget to stick around after the ad break for Flashback Firsties. 
Welcome to Flashback Firsty, and today we'll be looking back on a comic that I've had for a few months now, and just never really got the time to read. Yes, secretly this section is kind of how you can get me to basically read any first issue. Luckily, I own a few. Anyways, this is Top Cow's Death Vigil Number 1, amazingly written and drawn by the charismatic Croatian Stefan Sedjic. There's a war between death and necromancers, but death has her agents, or vigils, to aid in the war effort. And our lead character, in this issue anyways, is the Gravedigger, an ex-cop who uses an awesome combo of pickaxe and shovel as his Veil Ripper weapons. And of course, we come in when the war is getting the most intense, and we get to see a woman brought over from being dead into being a member of the Vigil. I really do need to deeply apologize that I've never read this until now. The art is, of course, fantastic. It's Sedgwick. Even when he takes four seconds to draw something on his deviant art, it's awesome. Death herself looks unique, but still in tune with death. The gravedigger looks freaking badass. The horrors from Beyond the Void look rightfully horrific. Then you get into the writing, which is generally light-hearted, but when it comes time to get heavy, it never strays or feels out of the blue. And we get some great character moments scattered throughout. This is a series that you should have right now. There's only eight issues in this series, and boy is every issue worth a read in its own right. And that's all for Flashback Firsties. Don't forget, leave a comment, tweet, or head on over to the Archivist Facebook page to let me know which issue you want me to do next. Don't forget, we've got the manga show and the webcomic show contest thing up and going, so head on over there and give me some names, and who knows, you might be able to win something. Anyways, thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, share us around, like, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Plus, this coming Thursday is another flashback binging on comics, this time for the obscure occult hero roaming around Gotham, Simon Dark. And remember, stay gold, Inklings.